Looks like we have a few more people that are joining us, but this might be a good time to go ahead and get started. Um, hi there, my name is Dave Jobby with Plan to Place and part of the consultant team. And you're here to talk all about Corte Madera housing tonight. This is our second meeting in the workshop series on existing conditions and opportunities and challenges. And before we get started, I'm gonna hand it over to Adam to do a welcome. Hi everyone, good evening. My name is Adam Wolf. Um, the director of planning and building with the town of Corte Madera. Um, and to echo what Dave said, I'd like to welcome you all to uh, the town of Corte Madera's housing element workshop series. So this is the second of six community workshops the town is holding, um, really with the goal to help communicate important information about the housing plan that the town will be uh, working on for the next 15 months or so. Uh, but really most importantly to engage with members of our community and hear from you about housing issues that the town uh, should be addressing and ultimately help us plan for new housing development over the next decade. Um, for those of you who weren't with us last month, the workshops are being held on the second Wednesday of the month from October to March. Uh, same time, uh, 6.30 p.m., same Zoom link, Really the idea being that the workshops follow a consistent rhythm and each workshop really builds on each other. So the last workshop in October provided a, an introduction to the housing element, what it is, why we are doing it. And uh, I'll, I'll make a plug for our website here. Uh, you can find that, that workshop, uh, the video recording and all workshops and a lot of other great information about this planning project um, on our website, www.cordomaderahousing.org. Um, but that means we're not gonna be going into uh, what we covered at the last meeting tonight. Um, however, this workshop really, um, really the goal is to continue the more informative, informal part of the workshop series, uh, aiming to provide members of our community uh, with a common baseline level of information and providing room for community dialogue and discussion that we hope is engaging and educational. So with me tonight, Dave, uh, Dave already introduced himself, but I'm going to introduce him anyways. Um, Dave Javid, founder and principal with Plan to Place, and Paul Kronzer, also with Plan to Place. Um, they're assisting the town with our community outreach uh, for this housing plan. And we also have with us tonight, um, excited to have David Bergman, a director with Lisa Wise Consulting, who has more than 25 years of experience in planning and public policy related to housing, and uh, who will be providing a presentation on existing conditions in a moment prior to our panel discussion. Um, so really thank you for your time and participation this evening. We appreciate you being here and hope you enjoy tonight's agenda. Great, thanks so much, Adam. Uh, so we, before we get started, I just wanna give you a quick overview of the agenda. Uh, as Adam mentioned, um, well, after we do a couple quick poll questions, as we always like to get a sense of who's with us during these meetings, um, we're gonna hand it over to David to do the existing conditions presentation. Um, we'll have a, a brief moment for clarifying questions or comments after that presentation, but we've allotted a bulk of the meeting tonight for a panel discussion, and you'll get to meet all the great panelists here shortly. Uh, and then we'll have a Q&A after that discussion as well. Um, and then we'll go ahead and let you know what's happening next and hopefully wrap up close to eight. But because we have such a great um, number of panelists with us tonight, we might go a little bit over eight tonight. Just wanna kind of cue that up, but we hope to stay right around that eight o'clock time to respect your time. Uh, and the meeting will be facilitated generally through um, the hand raise feature. So as we get to the Q&A, you'll find the hand raise either through your participant window, there'll be a raise hand feature there, or through your reactions button, both of which are on your toolbar at the bottom. If you haven't used them before, that'll bring up a little hand next to your name, and then I'll go ahead and unmute you and give you a chance to contribute. We also do have the chat window available. Um, so if you do have any questions, throughout the presentation, feel free to put them in the chat. And we'll hope to get to a bulk of the questions here tonight and whatever we don't get to, we'll hope to follow up on with a summary after the meeting. Um, so as I mentioned, the first thing we'd like to do, oops, is ask um, a series of 
uh, demographic questions. And we do this really at every meeting and you'll see that pop up on your screen now. Uh, and this is our opportunity again to get a sense of who's joining us this evening. And with that, we want to ask these same questions at every meeting so that we can identify more so who we're not reaching. And so we can continue to course correct as we go through all of these great workshops uh, and make sure our outreach is thorough and extensive. So this is great information for you to share with us. And once you have a chance to go through the questions, I'll then kind of turn it back and end the poll and share that back out with you all real quick before we move forward. So the questions are around um, where you live, where you work, um, why you decided to join us this evening, um, what is your current housing situation, what type of housing you live in, uh, and then typical um, demographic information around age and race and ethnicity. So I'm trying my best to stall here <laughs> as much as possible to give you a chance to contribute. Uh, I know there's quite a few questions, so it looks like you all are jumping in there, which is great. Um, we'll wait maybe another 30 seconds or so. And if you don't get a chance for any reason um, to get your input in here, no problem at all. We'll, we'll have a chance to kind of follow up and gather information as needed. So thank you all for your patience as we gather this really important information. Uh, let's see, we might wait another... 30 seconds or so. Looks like we have just over a half of you that have taken the survey. Um, excellent. We got a big uptick there. Okay, I think we've captured almost everyone now. So I'm going to go ahead and end the survey. Oh, great. We had a couple last minute additions. Okay, here we go. I'm going to end the poll now. Uh, and now I'm going to share the results back out with you all so you can kind of get a quick sense yourself of who's in the room with us. As expected, a vast majority of you live in Corte Madera and also work in Corte Madera. Um, although actually a good half of you um, are also unemployed or do not work or retired, um, which is a good kind of balance there. It uh, looks like you came here for a variety of reasons, which is great to see. You'll, you'll learn a lot tonight, and we really look forward to getting input from you as well. Vast majority own a home, um, which is either a house or a duplex. Uh, and we have a fairly good variety of age represented. So great. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing now. Uh, and then what we typically like to do at this point, too, is... Um, just ask you to test out the chat. This is something that Martha on the team enacted, which I kind of love, uh, just a chance to kind of throw a quick comment to the chat. In this case, provide one word that you would use to describe living or working in Corte Madera. And again, this is just a quick fun exercise, not critical, um, but just to, so that you know the chat is available as well to contribute. Um, so we'll do that at your leisure and we'll kind of go ahead and kind of take a look at that and report back on that later. Um, so with that, without further ado, I want to turn it over to Dave Bergman for the first presentation. Rick, thank you, everybody. And um, today's pr presentation, and I'm going to go through a lot of numbers and a lot of data. And um, I'll have some time at the end to answer questions. But also remember, this is recorded and the PowerPoint will be available for your future reference. I don't feel as though you have to massively take notes and, and you'll never have a chance to see this again. So the, the hope here is to develop a common understanding about what the um, existing conditions are for the housing market and the general economy in the town of Corte Madera so that we can have a common base of knowledge as we talk about the challenges and opportunities associated with housing and eventually the housing element uh, for Corte Madera. So the goal here is to uh, give everybody a common vocabulary, some numbers to match up with your lived experience of living and working and interacting with the town, um, and uh, uh, again, to, to develop that common base of knowledge. So go to the next slide, please. So we're going to talk about um, really uh, uh, four topics, which is housing uh, in Corte Madera, what the housing stock is, market trends, uh, the employment market where people live, where people work in Corte Madera, people who live in Corte Madera, and people who work in Corte Madera, uh, 
and then talking a little bit about what some of this means. Is it better the next slide, please? So Corte Madera town's population is around 10,000 people in 2020, which uh, represents about a 10% growth uh, over the last decade. And it's grown faster uh, than the rest of Marin County, but slower than the Bay Area as a whole. So um, uh, go to the next slide here. Um, one of the things you can see is there's an interesting age distribution in Corte Madera. And, and um, you can see how it's shifted over time. The blue bars there are 2000 and the gray bar is 2019. And you'll notice a really pretty steep drop off over the last 20 years in households that are headed by people aged 25 to 34. Um, so that's kind of a, a young working age population um, has really declined in the city over the last 20 years. What has grown have been school age children. Uh, so you can see that gray bar in, in five to 14 and, and a little bit less in the 15 to 24, but still growth, but big growth in that, in that school age children. And then uh, a growth in households uh, with uh, populations 45 to 55. So this tells me that these are, are older, um, uh, older parents, uh, maybe not people having, having children in their 20s, but maybe deferring uh, child uh, rearing to later years. Um, so there's a growth in the school age population, and it's also reflective of the overall attractiveness of Corte Madera to family households with children present. Another group that's increased significantly has been population over 65. That's common in a lot of California communities, particularly uh, to as, as there are a lot of economic incentives of aging in place. So that's something that we see uh, pretty commonly in, in across, the, across the state. So as I mentioned, the majority of the households in Corte Madera are family households. A family household is more than one related person in a household. Um, it's uh, similar to um, the county. It's a little bit less than the Bay Area as a whole. Um, so uh, that's, that's the nature of, uh, uh, of that distribution of family and non-family households. Next. Uh, households with children present. So Corte Madera has a higher proportion of uh, households with children present than either the, either the Marin County uh, or the Bay Area as a whole. So again, we see a lot of these uh, uh, households, this community, the town is very attractive to um, households, family households with children present. Yeah, next slide. Uh, there are the total inventory of dwelling units in Corte Madera is a little under 4,000 occupied units. Um, about two thirds of those are owner occupied, uh, which is uh, in line with Marin County. It's actually a little bit higher, but it's 10% or significantly higher than that ratio in the Bay Area as a whole. So uh, there's higher rates of home ownership, lower rates of renter occupied of the dwelling units that are that are available in the town. Now, this is an important measure here, which is cost burden. So when we say a, a household is cost burden, that means that they're spending more than 30% of their uh, income on housing, on their housing costs. And then we say households are severely cost burdened if they're spending 50% or more of their uh, monthly income on housing. And, uh, what we see is that severely, uh, so if you look at the owner-occupied housing in Corte Madera, there's a, a relatively large number actually, you know, almost a, a little over 30%, a little over a third of the owner-occupied units are uh, housing stressed. That means that people are reaching deep into their income to be, afford to live in Corte Madera, which I think is a, a reflection of its desirability, particularly for the households which we we've described, and it's more severe for the renter occupied housing units. Uh, there it's a little bit, uh, a little bit under half uh, are, um, uh, are, are, are cost burden. And a lot of that has to do with the available inventory of available rental units. 
go to the next slide, please. So about in total, about 38% of Corte Madera households are cost burden. Um, that's similar to both Marin County and the Bay Area as a whole. Uh, again, something that is interesting, both in Corte Madera and I think also throughout the Bay Area is to find the high number of owner-occupied units, the high proportion of owner-occupied units that are also experiencing cost burden. It's usually not something we see associated with ownership traditionally. Um, and some of this has to do with incomes, right? So if we look at the uh, uh, median income, right, in Corte Madera, in the town, the median income, household income is about $150,000. That's appreciably higher than the county average at 110,000 and significantly higher than the Bay Area as a whole at, at just over 85, almost 86,000. So um, uh, that's important. Another thing to note is that over 35% of Corte Madera households had incomes over 200,000. Where you see the gap is in middle income households, relatively speaking, both in comparison to the county and to the Bay Area. Corte Madera has relatively few middle income households. Go to the next slide, please. Uh, let's talk a little about the housing stock that's available. Much of that of the town was built before 1980. About a third of the units were built before 1960. And since 2010, uh, about 210, uh, 220 units have been built uh, in the last decade um, in the town. Let's talk a little bit about market trends. Go to the next slide. Uh, Corte Madero sales values are consistently higher than the county or the regional average. Again, people are willing to pay a premium to live in the community. Um, sales value was over one and a half million, which is about 30% higher. So a 30% premium over the Bay Area as a whole. Um, and uh, it, price, it, prices recovered from the, the 2007 a financial crisis peak in 2015. So there's been real growth since 2015 in housing value. It's all been recovered, anything that was lost from the financial crisis, um, which is quicker than either the county or uh, the Bay Area as a whole. Uh, rents uh, have also increased rather steeply in Corte Madera uh, in comparison to um, Marin County or the Bay Area as a whole. Average rent is about $2,500. Um, now this is from um, something called the American Community Survey, which tends to understate, we, it has a, a bias, it, it, it estimates low, but it estimates low consistently. So whether you can find a $2,500 uh, apartment, a month apartment in Corte Madera, difficult to say, but the relationship that it's significantly higher than the, than the county as a whole or the Bay Area average, that we have a lot of confidence in. Go to the next slide, please. Talk a little bit about employment in Corte Madera. So the labor force, what are the occupations of Corte Madera residents? And, and some of this shouldn't be surprising because we saw high incomes, um, high wage, uh, high skilled occupations, uh, business management, science, uh, and the arts are the leading occupational category for town residents. And this is significantly higher than uh, Marin County or the Bay Area. Next slide, please. Uh, if you look at industry, which is distinct from occupation, so residents of Corte Madera are largely employed in professional services, health and educational services, with professional services being the largest sector and that employs significantly more people than the county or the Bay Area as a whole. Again, this is consistent with the high wage, high skill labor force. The flip side to that is the jobs that are in Puerto Madera. So uh, retail and recreation, which includes food and beverage, so restaurants and bars, the are the leading sector, so retail and, and, and food and beverage are the leading sectors for employment in Corte Madera. And they tend to depend more on lower skill and lower wage employment. Um, and uh, this lack of available housing, affordable housing options, contributes to a job housing imbalance that we can discuss here. Go to the next, please. So commute patterns. Um, this is a little bit old. This is pre-COVID. Uh, unfortunately, the data doesn't get updated as often as we'd like, but essentially pre-COVID, there were 207 
Corte Madera residents who also worked in Corte Madera. So this pre-COVID, obviously things changed, but under normal circumstances or the old normal, almost 6,000 people came into Corte Madera to work and almost 4,000 residents left. The cities where employees lived who came in to Corte Madera were the city of San Francisco, San Rafael and Novato. Um, the top destination for town residents who commute out were, was largely San Francisco, far and away, but second and third were San Rafael and, and Larkspur. Next slide, please. And then looking a little bit at the commute patterns, how far people are coming to, uh, to work in Corte Madera, approximately 20% of all employees in Corte Madera commute more than 50 miles to get to work. A lot of those long distance commuters are coming from the south and the east. Um, and, uh, you know, again, almost uh, 1,600 employees commute to Corte Madera from the, from the southeast. So that gives you a sense. Talking a little bit about considerations for the future. What are the main takeaways from this? Which is that housing in Corte Madera is likely to remain in strong demand. Uh, Corte Madera commands a premium price over both the county and the region. There's a strong demand for housing in the town for households with uh, children present. And there's a big gap in housing uh, for a uh, younger population, 25 to 35 in that young working age population. There seems to be a, a gap and that's, we can hypothesize that's largely being driven by affordable housing options. Um, both homeowners and renters stretch to live in Corte Madera. Uh, there's a high proportion of population with cost burden and households are willing to pay a premium to be in Corte Madera. Um, the community's residents are employed in high skill, high wage occupations. However, the jobs that are located in Corte Madera are more likely to be lower skill and lower wage occupations. And this creates a commute flow um, that again, is probably something that fits with your lived experience in the community. So I appreciate the, uh, your uh, understanding of going through a lot of numbers quickly. And if there's anything you'd like to, um, look over, uh, have a little bit more explanation on it, I'd be happy to discuss it with you. Great, thanks so much, David. Um, as David mentioned, that's a lot of information to take in at once, but us, as you referenced, uh, this meeting was recorded and will be put on the website and the PowerPoint presentation is actually also posted to the project website. If you wanted to dive in deeper um, and think about it some and come back with any questions, but we thought we'd provide uh, maybe just a few minutes here if there were any clarifying questions from you all or, or comments at this time if you want to use the raise hand feature feel free to do that and or drop a comment in chat um, and if not sounds like you are all as anxious as we are to get to the panel discussion um, so thank you so much for that david and we'll have a chance to kind of think about those numbers and the existing conditions as we move through all of the different workshops that kind of acts as that foundational element um, for that process. So thank you for that presentation, Dave. And we'll go ahead then and move into the panel discussion. And I'm gonna hand it back over to Adam to get us started. Thanks, thanks Dave uh, and Dave. Um, appreciate that presentation and that information. I think it's really important um, as a baseline, as you said. Um, so, uh, I wanted to just provide a little bit of context um, around the panel that we decided to put together this evening. And really there are two main goals that we had in um, putting together this panel. First, I think we really thought it was important that our community heard from uh, other voices and perspectives uh, in town, uh, other than those of town staff and our consultant team um, I think we had a feeling it might be more engaging as well and draw more community members here into the process. And by the looks of it, I think we've, uh, we have a check, check mark there. That's, it's, we're, I think we succeeded it with that. Um, uh, but second and probably more importantly, we thought it would be great for our community to hear from individuals um, and organizations that can help ground the broader housing issues that we hear about pretty much on a daily basis in our local context in Corte Madera, and, and that perhaps it will help some members of our community think about housing issues in a new way, or just better understand other lenses through which local housing issues are viewed. 
Um, so I was really very excited when these five individuals agreed to join us tonight, as I think they really bring both a varied and unique perspective uh, uh, to local housing issues that town staff really just can't provide. Um, I, I was going to let our panelists introduce themselves in a minute, um, but just wanted to extend a huge thanks in advance uh, for all of your time and thoughts this evening. Um, also, special thanks to the wonderful uh, Julie Kritzberger, Executive Director of our Cordovadera Chamber of Commerce, who filled in at the last minute for one of our um, panelists who was unfortunately couldn't uh, um, be with us tonight uh, due to a family emergency. So thanks for that. Um, and with that, Dave, maybe we can, you're going to help kick this off for us or hand it over to our panelists for sure. the start of this discussion. Yeah, thank you so much, Adam. Yeah, so why don't we just go down the list here? We wanted to give each of the panelists just a couple minutes um, to introduce themselves. And then we had a few questions um, that we wanted to ask the panel to get the conversation started. Uh, and then we'll come to um, the Q&A with you all as participants as well. Um, so that we can have a nice discussion. So I'm going to just go down the list here and ask you to do a quick introduction. So Bianca, we'll start with you. Good evening. Thanks for having me here. Like you said, my name is Bianca Newman. I work for EAH Housing as their Director of Business Development. Um, the organization I work for actually has an affordable housing development in Corte Madera, um, San Cle Clemente Place. It's a uh, 79 unit family development. It was built in 2008. So it was about half of those units that were built between 2000 and 2009. Um, and I myself have worked in affordable housing for 15 years and I worked in the spaces of uh, property management, um, development and finance. Great, thank you so much, Bianca. Uh, next up is Samantha. Everyone, I'm Samantha Hauser. I'm with City Ventures. We are a sustainable developer out of San Francisco. Um, we were the state's first 100% solar all electric builder, and we have projects all over the Bay Area, including in Marin. Um, we're an infill developer, which means that we build in the context of existing urban spaces rather than in green fields or untouched hillsides. Um, and our bread and butter is sustainable housing. So uh, we partner with a lot of cities on that to really fill the needs of individual sites. And so that means in addition to housing, we build a lot of mixed use projects, um, a lot of public spaces like parks, urban agriculture, uh, community rooms. Our goal is always to complement existing neighborhoods, kind of understanding that we're not um, the first people to come into the space. You know, we're usually uh, somewhat closer to the end. Um, and then our homes are often targeted towards first time home buyers, young families and empty nesters. Um, so we're always exploring questions about how to make housing attainable. Um, and then in addition to that, I am a planning commissioner in the city of Pacifica. Great, welcome, Samantha. Uh, next, we'll go to Brett. Hi, everyone, I'm Brett Eithman. I'm the superintendent of Larkspur Corte Madera School District. This is my fifth year here in the district. Um, just wanna start with uh, just expressing gratitude to everyone in this room. Uh, as you probably read, uh, our district blazed the trail in opening in-person school for COVID. Uh, we wouldn't have been able to do that without you. Uh, as most of you know, our schools are community funded and community supported, and that really allowed us to leverage a number of resources to make things happen early on in the pandemic and bring kids back to in-person in -person learning. Um, our, you know, as you'll hear, as we go through different questions tonight, of course, we, we have a number of employees and, and look to attract the highest skilled employees uh, to work with the children in the community within LCM. So thanks for having us here tonight or having me here tonight. Excellent, thank you, Brett. Um, next, we'll go to Julie. Oh, Julie, we're having, we're having slight trouble hearing you, I think, unless that's just on my end. No, I think that'll be, yeah. Can you hear me now? Uh, we can hear you better, yeah. Okay. Uh, my name is Julie Kritzberger, and I've been the Executive Director for the Corte Madeira Chamber of Commerce for the last 27 years. Uh, I represent the business community, and we coordinate the town's 4th of July Parade Festival. I chair the Beautification Committee in town, which keeps everything in basket and we put on the Oktoberfest. Still having some trouble, Julie. Yeah, sorry, Julie. You, you, you cut out a little bit. Um, 
No problem. Maybe we'll give you a chance to check on that and we can come right back to you. Uh, why don't we jump over to Carrie and then we'll come back to you, Julie. Good evening. Uh, Carrie Pollard with Marin Water, also known as Marin Municipal Water District. I am the water efficiency manager um, there at the district. I've been there for two years but I come with a few decades of water efficiency experience up in uh, Sonoma County. Uh, Marine Waters are the local water supplier. We not only supply water to the town of Puerto Madera, but um, throughout central and southern Marin, um, providing water to about 191,000 people. We're also responsible for uh, the watershed, so about 2,200 um, or 22,000, excuse me, acre feet of watershed lands up in Mount Tam. So it's a pleasure to be here. I look forward to the discussion. Excellent. Thank you, Carrie. Um, and Julie, my guess is most people in the virtual room know you well. Um, so <laughs> we'll, we'll assume that that's the case and you'll have an opportunity to answer actually a question that's coming up um, right away here. I do see a couple questions that came in through chat. We really appreciate that. We'll definitely get to those questions and other questions for the participants. But before we get started, we just wanted to put out a couple questions um, to allow the panel to start the conversation uh, and then we'll go to Q&A. Um, so the first question is, we just heard from, from Dave Bergman about the high cost of housing in Corte Madera and the commuting patterns on the labor force. And we were curious how these issues affect your particular organizations um, for members of the panel. And, most particularly, I was curious if Brett, um, Bianca, and Julie would maybe take this first question. Um, so maybe Brett, we'll start with you. Sounds great. So a couple of years ago, we provided the Board of Trustees with a human resources report, um, taking a look at all sorts of things from salary and benefits to retention to commuting patterns as well. And so uh, what we found was pretty interesting in terms of commuting patterns. We have... Um, 66% of our staff live within Central or South Marin, 13% in Nevada, 8% in San Francisco, 4% from Sonoma, and 9% from the East Bay. I think that's an anomaly. I think that that's pretty unique um, when I talk to my counterparts in other districts. Um, we do have a very experienced staff. And so if I take a look at the hiring patterns of my newer staff members, one of the things that we've relied heavily on are community partners to assist with things, especially looking at housing. So um, I'm sure a number in the room might be familiar with Jordan Moss, who's with uh, Catalyst Housing Group and, and uh, the Serenity Complex over in Larkspur. Um, we've been able to use that as a, that, that program as a recruitment tool. So we have a number of new teachers that actually live in the Serenity Complex. Some have moved from Southern California, some even from out of state. They're newer and, and in terms on, on that salary schedule and having this type of housing option was a, uh, a game changer in terms of, of hiring those, the staff members. And so what we're anticipating is as some of our experienced staff members uh, retire or, or move on to other things, um, we're going to either experience some changes in our, in our commuting patterns if we don't have workforce housing options. Um, you know, being a teacher is, is challenging enough. And, and, and one of the things that we've been looking a lot at is not just the teacher and the teacher's salary, um, but also looking at the entire system as a whole. You know, you're, you're thinking about student loans. You're thinking about, of course, that rent or housing. You're thinking about uh, what that commute may take place. Um, you're thinking about also if, if they have a family or, or planning on having a family, childcare costs. So there's so many different things that come into play with being a teacher. And if we could give some relief in terms of housing, that, that, that's huge. Um, one of the app, uh, impacts that we have right now in terms of how Marin is, is situated is we are having a really difficult time um, uh, in terms of our applicant pools. So, uh, you know, I, I should have included this, included this in my introduction, um, but I moved up here from Southern California. So uh, my first 17 years of my career were there. I recently was uh, talking with the new superintendent over Manhattan Beach, which is where, where I was, and asking them about what, what are their, you know, applicant pools looking like. And while there's a shortage that we're all experiencing, I think our shortage is, is at a much greater scale than others. 
because Marin can operate in kind of a little bit of an island. It's hard to get to unless you have housing options like Serenity or have uh, you know a, a dual income household that can afford afford this area. So uh, we are concerned about that um, and, our, and our ability to, to hire in the future. So I'd say that's that's kind of the, the short of it with that. Great, Brett. No, thank you for that context. That's great. I'm sure there'll be some questions that we can kind of come back to that as well. So thank you for that. Uh, next, how about we go to Bianca? Sure. Um, I think in a broader context, you know, this is what affordable housing does. It sort of addresses this need, uh, especially in places where uh, housing costs are higher than um, uh, the individuals that are working there, especially. I mean, I think David pointed out the, the gap in inflow versus outflow and um, the number of service jobs present within Corte Madera. And so um, as an affordable housing provider, I think one of the, the, the way that things like this really impact the way that we approach affordable housing would be to look at things like a lo local live work preference or something like that, where you could really um, try and make an environmental impact and um, limit traffic flow by allowing people that uh, work within the city of Puerto Madera to also live here. That's great. Thank you, Bianca. Thank you for that context as well. Uh, Julie, we wanted to come to you to see if uh, you would like to add to this discussion. Julie, I think you might be mute. There you go. Can you hear me now, though? Uh, it's still a little bit choppy. Can you speak a little I louder? I to another computer. I'm sorry. No, no problem. Fine. Yeah. We'll, we'll definitely have, we'll, we'll be here for a while. So go ahead and no. <laughs> get dialed in and we can come back. I think we could hear you if you just speak a little louder, Julie, right? Is that better? Yeah, it's a little better, yep. Okay. So um, finding employees is the biggest challenge for, the, for my chamber members. Um, a lack of affordable housing and traffic makes it difficult to attract employees. I've heard from many of our local businesses that they've had to reduce hours because they can't find enough employees. Most of the businesses already pay a living wage, but this still isn't enough for them to be able to live locally. Employers are trying several different ways to attract employees, including bonuses, flexible hours, and increasing pay. Great, thank you so much, Julie. Uh, in we're going to go ahead and, uh, and go to the next question. You know, I realize I'm sharing my screen, so I'm going to go ahead and stop doing that so we can all see each other a little bit better. Um, the next question I wanted to ask is, uh, so the development of new housing, including affordable housing in Marin and Corte Madera, could help alleviate some of these issues that we've been discussing here tonight but not a lot of new housing has been developed in recent years. And we're curious um, why you think that's the case and what potential opportunities exist to develop new housing and thoughtfully plan for housing production at all economic levels. Uh, and I thought maybe we'd start with Samantha on this question and then go over to Carrie and maybe Bianca. So Samantha, you're up. Sure, and it's, it's a great question. Um, I think, housing projects really come with a lot of stakeholders. There are existing community members and they don't all, it's not all one voice, right? You know that the community has a lot of different voices. You have future community members, so the people you're building the housing for. Um, you have all the different divisions of the local government. So your town council, planning commission, planning staff, fire and police, public works, sewer and water districts. Um, and then you have like state government stakeholders as well. And all of this is kind of interrelated. So it's really hard to take all of that, all of the, the requests and all of the different ideas and balance them. But a good developer um, will work with each of these stakeholders and kind of find that path that um, everyone can really get behind and also start working with the community early and honestly on what can be achieved. Um, I think one of the best ways to ensure that those good projects actually get built is to provide developers with predictability. So that comes from good planning, which is what we see happening now with the series, right? You know, involving the community, starting the process of identifying how to get housing. Um, it also comes from making things like design guidelines and standards really clear and understandable. 
um, making costs like city fees and town fees easy to ascertain and understand and providing developers with a process that has predictable timing. And that doesn't mean that fees have to be low and that timelines have to be short because you know it's, it's California, that just is not gonna happen. But if you can understand that from the get-go, then you will actually ensure that these projects that go through this really long process get built. Great, appreciate that, Samantha. Great food for thought. Um, as, I, we, as we think about this challenge. Yes, Adam, go ahead. I was gonna have a follow-up on that. Is there anything sure. also, I'm just from a from a site, um, sort of identifying appropriate sites, um, is there anything that specifically is challenging about a marine context versus potentially others um, that you've experienced? I know you've done, you've worked with the city of Novato on a, on a housing development fairly recently, but just curious what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, I think, you know, as infill developers, every project has unique challenges, right? So there are not a lot of sites left and a lot of them have physical challenges, like the geology is weird or um, there's contamination that has to be remediated. I think um, when you get to Marin County there, I mean, the presentation that we saw at the onset really kind of shows there's a lot of in commuting, there's a lot of home ownership. And when you own your home, and I, I own my home Pacifica, when you own your home, it's really hard to think about, you know, the future homeowners that really need a place to, to live. And so how do you wrap your head around the idea that like, we, we have this place that we love so much and there could be an increase in traffic or an increased pull on resources, but we also need to be sustainably minded and provide homes for, for the future. So I think, um, that's something that comes with a lot of different localities in the Bay Area, but in Marin, it is particularly challenging. Great question. Thanks, Adam. Thanks for that, Samantha. Um, Carrie, if you wouldn't mind, we're going to go to you next. Yeah, sure. That's great. So, um, you know, as the local water supplier for us, um, it's kind of rare that land use planning entities and local cities and local jurisdictions reach out to us in a meaningful way prior to development. I and mean, it's more often that, that a site is developed, it's approved, and then they walk through the door and say, hey, we're here for a water meter. And so increasing the collaboration and coordination between the local jurisdictions as, you know, these new housing elements roll out is, is really important. And, and where I see the biggest opportunity is really around increasing overall efficiency. So ensuring that new housing that gets built is as water efficient as possible, that the landscapes that are installed are as, as efficient as possible, right? Those fixtures meet or exceed state standards. And that's really where, where, where I see the, the biggest opportunity, because as the water district, we don't have authority over, you know, yes or no to water, I mean, yes or no to, um, to developments, where they'll be developed. That's really the land use planning uh, is authority. So, so we look at efficiency and where are those opportunities. And, and we've already started to see some of that in the region, right? So we have fairly strict efficiency standards for, you know, indoor fixtures, but really outdoor water using, um, you know, landscapes is really where we see the biggest opportunity right now and the biggest bang for a buck and really the the more the, the more stringent measures that are kind of being rolled out within the region for um, limiting outdoor irrigation and, and landscaping. So um, yeah, so for us, efficiency is going to be key as we move forward in, in, uh, in looking at new developments. I think it's also important to recognize, right, there's not a direct, there, there's not a direct correlation in, in growth and water demands, right, because different types of units use different amounts of water, right, a high density apartment will use less water per unit than a single family home. And so understanding, um, you know, what the city's kind of long-term plans are and what types of developments will go in and where will actually help us also understand the impacts on water supply as we move forward. So. Excellent. Thank you for that, Carrie. Really good to have that perspective as we talk about housing. Uh, and then Bianca, I was gonna come back to you if uh, you'd like to add some to the conversation. I would like to echo everything Samantha said is absolutely true. Consistency is really important. Um, and, you know, and as Carrie said, efficiency, efficient water use is really important and affordable housing is held to very high standards for, for environmental efficiency. Um, I will add to, to their comments that, you know, I think one of the reasons you haven't seen development is really um, density. And 
part of that really goes to there is a baseline number of units within a development that have to be produced in order for it to pencil. Um, and if you, so, you know, um, in Marin County that based on the, the income levels here, that's around 40 units. Um, and the density allowed per acre is, is pretty low. And so the number of sites that are large enough to support that minimum number of units to, to like achieve operating efficiency and actually be able to finance a project um, are few. And so I think being thoughtful about uh, where you choose to develop and maybe you know, looking at uh, transit-oriented development and maybe doing some upzoning in those places, thinking about um, doing affordable housing overlays and uh, maybe pick places that are more commercial where um, uh, higher density will have uh, a lesser impact on you know, residential housing. So I think there are things like that that can be done that can really um, push things forward and allow more units to be created in this community. Excellent. Thank you so much for that, Bianca. Uh, and I had one final question um, for the group, and then we'll go ahead and transition over to the Q&A from participants. I do see some great questions coming in through chat. Um, so the final question is, um, the Corte Madera of the future will look different than today, obviously. Uh, what strategies do you think Corte Madera should implement or rely upon to ensure that the change that will happen is positive and improves our community's quality of life? Super simple question, right? Uh, so anyone on the panel, would you like to field that question? Oh, I'm happy to go ahead and start. Yeah, great, Brett, you're up. Um, and so I, I think, you know, from the school district perspective, um, having options for staff members to live in the community in which they serve. There's something to be said about being able to go into Trader Joe's and and see your teacher, right? Or, you know, go shopping or, or, or trick or treat or whatever it is and run into people that work at your school. It builds, you know, stronger sense of community. Um, it's something that is overall just an asset to have. And, uh, you know, we're fortunate enough where a number of our staff members do live, you know, in, in this in this local region, but I fear and, and, and would predict that that's gonna change pretty drastically um, as we have staff turnover um, and, and just natural attrition. So um, having affordable housing, having housing that, that teachers and staff would want to live into, I think is a big thing, um, and, and potentially plant the roots for some time. Another uh, consideration would be just transportation options. So if there isn't enough housing for you know, uh, teachers and staff, uh, to take advantage of, then the ability to, to get here um, in, a, in a reasonable amount of time or, or with, you know, the least amount of impact on our, on our overall uh, environment and community. And so what other transportation options could be thought of uh, to help to help out with that, with that commuting piece? So th those are the two that I had thought of. Great. Yeah, thank you for that, Brett. Thank you. I think that ties together a lot of the conversation we've had and what we heard from, from Dave early on. Um, during his presentation. Any other thoughts from the panel before we turn it over to Q&A? Yes, Samantha, I see you unmuted yourself. <laughs> sure. Um, you know, I think we need to be really thoughtful about um, what the fabric of the Bay Area looks like in the future. And I have a one-year-old and a four-year-old, so it's something I think about a lot. Um, we do a lot of attached homes that live like single-family homes and maybe have the same size and bedroom count, but they're attached. So they they sit efficiently on a site and that allows for them to um, be priced attainably and to really be a place where a family can grow but not have to pay you know, $2 million for a house. And if you look at Marin, that's really what it costs and it's really hard. So I think attainable housing, um, access to good transportation opportunities, having things be both like walkable and bikeable, and then also providing things like EV charging just as a standard in every parking space in a garage, right? That makes it really easy. Um, and then another thing that makes housing really attainable is having low utility bills. So we should not be building gas to projects anymore. It's just the thing of the past. You should have solar all electric, you should have nest thermostats, you should have low flow water fixtures and low impact landscaping. Um, and these are things that are easy to, to do if you think about them from the onset. 
Great, thank you for that, Samantha. Thank you for that. I'll just uh, add to that. Um, sure. So, uh, and, and I would say that the low impact landscapes doesn't mean rocks and cactus, right? You can have really beautiful low water use landscapes with the right amount of turf based on, you know, the, the site use um, and make it, you know, have people spend less time, you know, mowing their lawns and, you know, going out and doing fun stuff that they actually enjoy. Um, and so, you know, it doesn't mean, low water use doesn't mean rocks and cactus. You, you, there, there's plenty of other plant material that would work. So I'll just add that. Awesome, thank you, Carrie. I'm sure you have some great examples as well that you've seen. It's a great point. Um, all right, if there aren't any other thoughts from the panel, I think we'll go ahead and move over to the Q&A portion with the members of the community um, or participants that are here with us today. So I wanted to just mention, I got a note from one person that uh, they're having trouble accessing the raise hand feature. And if you go, most likely you have the latest version of Zoom. If you go to that little reactions button, in your toolbar, um, you'll see the raise hand right at the bottom of those reactions. But no problem, if for some reason you can't access it, you could physically raise your hand, you could leave us a quick note in chat, and we'll make sure that we unmute you and give you a chance to contribute. Adam, I saw you unmuted yourself. Did you have a thought before I get started? I think I was trying to get Julie uh, unmuted there, so hopefully she was able to do that. Oh yeah, there you go. Julie, did you have a... Yeah. Go ahead. Yes, please. Oh, on the last question? Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to say that I think affordable housing in Corte Madero would be a great asset for the business community. Having employees that can live locally is a win-win for everyone. It reduces the carbon footprint, which is important to our residents, and having employees live locally means they can be part of the community and give back. Having employees that don't have to commute means they have time for other things like supporting the town and being involved. Additionally, they're able to support the schools and the merchants, giving them the opportunity to live locally gives them the option of walking or biking to work, which is good for the environment and healthier for the employees. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Julia. Thanks again for joining us here this evening. Um, so I see a ton of questions in chat. And instead of having me read them, I'd love for you all that are here with us to actually verbalize them if you're comfortable doing so. One I'll just throw in there from Chris Moe says that every county has to step up and add more dwelling units for the people working in our communities. I think that ties directly to the conversation we've been having here tonight. Um, there was a question from Denise about how many housing units are planned or proposed um, and where they'll be built. I um, just want to reiterate that this is just the housing um, element update, which really isn't identifying new housing and exactly incentivizing it to be built anywhere in town. Uh, it's uh, We're just kind of setting the course for potential housing. I'm going to let Adam go ahead and speak to that question as well, just to make sure that we have- Yeah, Denise, Denise uh, please come to the next workshop where we'll be specifically talking about planning um, where facilitation of new housing development should uh, should go or, or and, and where we should plan for that in town. So that's really the next three workshops are going to be focusing on uh, specifically where to uh, plan for new housing development. Perfect. Thank you. Dave, you're on mute. I, I am on mute. I didn't want to talk over Adam and accidentally use <laughs> myself. Uh, so I, I wanted to give Cheryl an opportunity, and I apologize if I mispronounce your last name, but Longinoti, Longinoti, are you here with us still? I wanted to see if you want to actually ask your question yourself. I might just go ahead and throw it out to the panel then. Um, Sh Cheryl's question was, if there's been an effort to measure or estimate housing needs for empty nesters and seniors who want or need to downsize or obtain more assistance while remaining in Corte Madera? Uh, I, th I think that's a great question and something I think we'll continue to think about as we go down the road with this workshop series, but any thought from the panel or Adam or David on that question? That's a great one. Um, yeah, that was... You're gonna have to repeat that for me. I was caught. I was caught looking at other questions on the chat. So <laughs> no, no problem. I mean, that, 
<laughs> you know what? Actually, I'm going to let Cheryl go ahead and ask it herself. Cheryl, yeah. you, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Okay. All right. I'm, I'm unmuted myself. You hear yes, me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. Yeah. So, so my question is uh, whether there's an effort to um, estimate uh, I guess I'd put it, estimate the needs of, of seniors who may want to um, stay in the community and want to downsize or need to downsize. And they, they um, are looking for options here in Corte Madera. And not only I think would that be a welcome option for them because they could stay in the community, but it would free up housing they, in uh, single family homes, say, that are that are um, underutilized because we have widows or widowers um, living in those and, and with maybe yeah. vacant bedrooms and so on. So um, yeah. I'd like to see us look at that aspect of the needs of, of the senior community. Yeah, I, and I would just say I would love to work with you and uh, whether it's age-friendly age Madera or other groups and trying to get some additional information on that. I mean, we it's not an easy uh, number to estimate other than we can put out some surveys perhaps or uh, potentially, um, you know, we, we hear about this anecdotally, of course, as well. And, and certainly with uh, accessory dwelling units, we've seen sort of a um, the use of those units um, for sort of um, actually, some of our, our, our residents moving into the accessory dwelling units and then renting out their front homes and so on and so forth, but additional flexibility. So I think it's a great point. Um, uh, it, it may be a little bit more difficult to actually measure the exact need, but we can certainly work with you and others to uh, attempt to do that through all our great Corte Madera organizations in town working yeah. on uh, Age yeah. Age Friendly does want to. Um... Um, they did a survey several years ago when they got started. I think that's maybe four or five years ago, and they want to re redo a survey of uh, seniors right. in the community. So we will work with you, Adam, on that. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Cheryl. I see one other question I wanted to take, and then Pat will come to you next. I see your hand raised. Um, Carl posed early during the presentation. Uh, Carl Spurzman, are you with us? If you want to verbalize yourself, if not, I'll take a pass at Paraphrasing your question here, um, you noted that you suspect that a good portion of jobs in Corte Madera are in the retail sector and most workers from outside Corte Madera work in these jobs. And those jobs experience a, quite a bit of turnover. So your question was, so if the goal is to provide low cost housing for folks who commute here for work, what type of workers who commute here are we trying to help? And how do we plan to monitor who benefits from affordable housing? Um, if those persons or jobs um, start, or I'm sorry, if, if that person changes jobs and starts a job in San Francisco, so if they're only here for a short time. That's a tough question I wanted to put out there to see if, Bianca, I see you unmuted yourself. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, one of the reasons that there's such high turnover is because it's hard for people to make those long commutes, right? Like that is, uh, that's causal. Um, and so if people are able to work closer to home, they're more likely to stay in their jobs for longer periods of time um, uh, because it costs them less to commute. Like commute costs aren't cheap, right? We, we all know what gas prices are these days and taking the bus is also, you know, a, a, a large cost. And, um, as to the monitoring piece, affordable housing is highly monitored. So to move into affordable housing, you, you know, you have to share your last three years of taxes. You have to disclose every person living in your household. You, the, the amount of information you're expected to share is immense. And you're expected to do that every year. So every year you have to recertify and as affordable housing providers, we have to recertify each of the people living within our residence to keep our tax credits. Um, and there is a threshold over which um, people no longer qualify to live uh, within affordable housing. Um, and we actually hope that people graduate from affordable housing. Like, I think, you know, what we've found is if people are stabilized in affordable housing, they're able to focus 
on bettering other parts of their lives. And so, you know, when you're not just scrambling to survive, you can thrive. And EAH housing uh, in our communities, as do a lot of, uh, you know, our counterparts, um, we provide after school, academically based after school programs in our communities. We provide um, lifelong learning services to individuals living in our community. So we're, you know, providing, you know, budget training. Uh, we have scholarship programs that we, uh, that we provide to students. And so, I mean, I think the hope is that people do move on and uh, do improve their circumstances and then new people that need that housing are able to, to live there. Yeah, um, and Thank I just wanted to add one anecdote that I, thanks Bianca, I, uh, but one anecdote that I uh, have from, that relates to this question from Carl is, is you know, I did talk to the uh, managers over at Amy's uh, drive through recently, and I was just asking them about, you know, how their hiring is going and the process and, and whatnot and what challenges they're having. But in, in the conversation, actually, he, he was talking about um, where people were coming from and whatnot, but did in fact uh, tell me that actually three of their employees do live at San Clemente Place um, apartments. So I'm just like, oh, well, they're, you know, that's, that's quite a commute right there. It's basically walk across the street and you're at work. So I, I just found that to be an interesting anecdote. But I also think it, it points to, you know, we're, we're not going to have a one-to-one -one ratio where everybody who comes and lives and San Clemente Place or another, you know, workforce housing has to live in Corte Madera. This is a, you know, could help support other businesses in Southern Marin and, and locally um, beyond, you know, just Corte Madera itself. And I don't think there's anything necessarily negative about that, um, but um, or even San Francisco for that matter. But, it, you know, anyways, just want to respond with that. Excellent. Thank you, Bianca and Adam. Uh, Pat, I see your hand raised. We'll go to you and then we'll field another question from the chat. Pat, you should be able to unmute yourself. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, welcome, Pat. Hi, thank you so much. And thank you for, uh, for doing this. Um, well, as I see it, other than finding the land and then making the economics work, I think the tide has turned in terms of the community actually wanting, I think, to support uh, more affordable housing. But I'm wondering, um, other than solving those two big problems, what can we do? I know the county out at San Quentin, um, across from San Quentin, that new development is specifically going to designate for workforce housing. I think they're specifically targeting schools and um, public employees and also possibly first responders, healthcare workers. And I think that a project like that, that was specifically, and also possibly including seniors as well. I agree with Cheryl Longinetti that it's a real need. And Puerto Madera is actually, I understand, the only community in Marin that does not have designated senior housing. And I just think this is more of an opinion than a question that um, we would get, uh, you would get a lot more support from the community if it really was designated uh, workforce housing. And my question is, you know, are there examples of really great public-private partnerships that have been done to create kind of a, a, a village or a community of affordable housing that's not 20% affordable, but maybe 80% affordable that really does go towards uh, just s solving the problem and not creating a financial incentive for developers to come in and as they did with our um, wind cup project you know that's mostly market rate housing so it doesn't really serve the affordable need as much as it could and are there examples of public private partnerships where um you know a park or a movie theater or a swimming pool or something is built into the project for the community so that it's not just a separate place where lower income people or des workforce housing lives, but it really is brought into the community with some kind of community center, plaza, that kind of idea to make it more, uh, more saleable, I think, to the, to the community and more, yeah. and more, and more serviceable too, you know, that we're, it gives something back to the community. Yeah, that's a fantastic question, Pat. Thank you for that. Um, so I would assume, yeah, Samantha and or Bianca, you might have some thoughts on that. Samantha, would you like to start? 
Sure. Um, so that, that kind of um, spurred two different thoughts. Um, and I think it's a really great point. Um, I have this conversation a lot as to like, what is affordable housing? Does it have to be deed restricted? Um, and I think what we really want to focus on is, as at, at my company at least, what we focus on is building a variety of types of housing. Um, and that is a way to cater. And it's, it's, you know, we do inclusionary housing all the time that's deed restricted, but unlike EAH, it's not, you know, 80% deed restricted or 100% deed restricted. So we, we would be called a market rate developer. Um, but we do things like, um, you know, for example, this project that we're working on in Milpitas, every home has an ADU built into it that provides a rental opportunity in a place where almost all of the homes are between 1.4 and $1.6 million, right? And there's not an opportunity to have that type of rental built in. So that's something that we're building. Um, we've done some, uh, some homes in Windsor and Union City. We've done them all over the place where we do shopkeeper, ground floor commercial. Um, on, the, on the bottom floor, it's really flexible. It could be retail, a restaurant, office with residential above. And there are a lot of instances in which the person that owns that home also works in the retail space below. And that helps with a lot of the costs that we talk about. Um, and so I, I think catering to like a workforce and missing middle doesn't necessarily mean getting tax income credits when you're building. It just, it doesn't have to. Um, to answer your other question about um, building uh, open spaces and having um, really wonderful amenities that could become part of the fabric of a neighborhood, um, we are currently building a project in Nevada. We purchased the land from the city of Nevada. They chose us as their partner developer. And it's 75 homes, um, you know, football field worth of open space. It's just for the community. Um, and there are all sorts of different amenities in there. And then a public park. Um, and the public park is something that was financed by being able to build the housing. Um, and the maintenance of the public park is something that the HOA for that project will be taking care of in perpetuity. So the taxpayers are not paying for it. The homeowners know going in that that's something that they're gonna pay for. So I think there are these opportunities, but it doesn't have to be one thing. Excellent. Thank you, Samantha. And it's always great to include a, a local example um, that folks can wrap their head around it and hopefully see come to fruition and get to experience because we, we definitely want to see housing that kind of integrates well with the rest of the community. And it's always great to have amenities that could be a part of that as well. Um, I'm going to throw one question into the mix from Kathy, I see in chat, and then we'll come to you next, Peter. Uh, but Kathy suggested if there's any consideration of co-housing to address housing needs for a diversity of households. She noted that uh, co-housing can address needs for working mothers, which is a key demographic to address quality of life for women and children. Um, so team, any good co-housing examples? or considerations that maybe you've considered um, as part of this process? I don't know if David Bergman, if that's a strategy that you've considered as we've worked on other housing elements in other locations, regardless well, of- uh, Co-housing has a mixed history um, in the US. It's very popular in Scandinavia um, and in other parts of Europe. Um, but it, it's something that is a, uh, an allowable housing type. And, you know, uh, the, oftentimes it needs um, um, some outside support from a philanthropy or uh, uh, some extra, maybe a write down on the land values. It's, it's not as popular of a product as it is in other parts of the world, but it's certainly something that's legal and should be considered as a part of an allowable development mix in Corte Madera. Great, thank you for that, Dave. Yeah, uh, great to think about, definitely like diversifying the housing stock in that way, um, very smart. Uh, Peter, we're gonna come to you and I'll try to jump. There's a lot of questions coming through chat, which is fantastic. I'm trying to keep it the best I can, uh, but Peter, you should be able to unmute yourself if you'd like to contribute. Yeah, okay, thank you uh, for giving me the chance here. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. This is a, a question for Adam. I mean, we're planning for 700 new homes. Okay, is that mean? Does that mean affordable homes? Because I mean, that's a huge number. Because you know, when the developers uh, come in there, 
uh, there's only a certain percentage of uh, homes that are or, or part of their project that are considered affordable. For example, um, in the Wind Cup or, or Tam Ridge, whatever you want to call it, um, that was only 10% affordable out of the 180 units. So uh, we ended up with just 18 uh, that actually counted towards the ABAG um, MTC um, quotas. So I'm just wondering, um, I mean, is this 700, does that mean uh, affordable? Because I mean, we could get these massive projects if, if, we, yeah. if we don't um, actually, uh, I, I think you got it, Adam. What, what, what are you gonna yeah, say? Yeah, I, I do, I do, thanks, Peter. So it, it, for the housing element itself, the definition of affordable and, and planning for affordable housing comes from the state. And uh, so we have to meet, basically they say, if a site is zoned for a certain density, theoretically that will facilitate the uh, development of affordable housing. And we do have to say, we have to meet certain income categories through that planning process. So, so it is it is sort of a um, it is sort of a, a good question in that uh, the state defines how we actually say we plan for affordable housing. What gets built is is the a good question, and and really we should be thinking about if we are trying to develop workforce housing, how do we partner with with organizations that do develop affordable housing? How do we help find um, places where affordable housing or workforce housing could be developed, 100% affordable housing. So it's it's sort of a second step. Uh, there's two different, you're right, there's two different sort of processes here. One's the planning for and making sure we have a compliant housing element. And then the second step is really figuring out how to get it built, which is, which I think Bianca can really speak to more than I. And it's a very complicated process, but I think that's one of the reasons why it's great to have Bianca here tonight and hear the conversation in our community about what really we're trying to, to do here. Um, uh, but, you know, we do have some funding through our affordable housing fund that has uh, been, been developed over the course of several years with some of the commercial development. So that can be thrown in. Uh, the town does own some property, of course. And so those are things that can help, um, you know, make these, as Bianca said earlier, affordable house, hundred percent affordable housing developments pencil. Um, but I think there's also the opportunity, of course, um, uh, to uh, obtain uh, defined, you know, affordable housing in other ways too. We have ADUs and we have other things that um, have been proven to, um, we have our inclusionary ordinances and whatnot that do um, not only have deed restricted affordable housing, but essentially affordable housing by design. So anyway, it's good. It's a really good question, Peter. I think we'll, we can talk about it more in the upcoming workshops. Excellent. Thank you for that question, Peter. And thank you, Adam. Um, so through the chat, I'm seeing a lot of support uh, for housing for older adults or seniors. Um, you all are sharing some amazing resources, which is awesome to see. Um, let's go ahead and take this question from Peter. I see your hand raised and then I'll come back and see if I can add a few more questions from the chat. And if you all are here and would like to verbalize any of your questions, we'd greatly encourage that as well. It'd be great to see you all. Um, so Peter, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Thank you for that. Um, so having participated in the previous round of the housing element as a planning commissioner, um, it's interesting that a number of questions are coming up that occurred in the previous effort, which means we have more work to do. Um, my comment that was in the chat was um, really appreciated the data that you guys put together in your presentation, but I thought it would be interesting to add a little more dimensionality to it to give sort of uh, what we think of as a heat map kind of approach. And that has to do with, of the various households um, by either ownership or rental, which age group are in there and what percentage of that age group has school-aged children in those households. 
And so the idea behind the adding dimension to it is it creates the ability to be more actionable. So as an outgrowth, when we want to know or try and correlate it to, okay, if they're in a rental household, how old is it? How fragile are they in terms of their cost burden and their income? So we know how much more assistance is required to either upgrade these homes, whether it's for electrification or other things, or how um, fragile are they that they might lose their home, which changes you know, the nature of the housing stock. And I think your chart was very um, prominent in showing that the 25 to whatever it was, 40 age group is not, is declining is because the housing stock is so bloody expensive that many of us obviously could not afford to live here if we were trying to move in. And, um, and so I think that also goes with the question about the elderly. And so I think adding some dimensionality to the data that you have would uh, provide some additional insight to the effort and enable the town to um, create a, a, a list of actions moving forward on a number of efforts. And again, I gotta applaud you guys. This is no small feat dealing with this beast. And thank God you guys have the energy. So thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, yeah, and I saw that great suggestion in the chat as well, something for our team to definitely consider um, in creating those those great visuals as well that'll help folks kind of understand what all this great data and information means uh, and guide the process. So I, I appreciate that thought and thank you for verbalizing that as well. Um, I see folks adding in support for ADUs, um, for people with disabilities. Uh, there's been suggestions on um, creative ways of providing temporary salary supplements for teachers and staff with lower salaries, uh, and, uh, considering if businesses could set aside money for housing differentials that can attract new hires. Uh, and you all are providing links to New York Times articles and other great resources, which is awesome. Um, as Peter just mentioned, we could use all the help we can get. This is going to be uh, quite a challenge. Um, so I really appreciate you all uh, chipping in with those thoughts. Uh, is there any other, anyone else, uh, and I might be mispronouncing your name, but Jonah Held, were you trying to raise your hand earlier visually? No? Okay. I just want to make sure I didn't miss that. Um, Adam or team, is there anything else in chat that you might see that I'm missing? I, I think most of it was kind of echoing some of the previous comments and questions. Um, well, Glenn had a great question of how, if we can clarify the process from here forward. Uh, which is actually what we're about to get to next, talking about next steps. Um, but Glenn, if you want to verbalize that, I saw you raise your hand, you're welcome to. Um, and if not, again, all of this fantastic uh, information that you all provided in chat and verbally, we'll take and make sure that it does show up in the summary and that we consider as we move through this process. Uh, we really value all your time and your input. As we move through this, it's extremely important that we hear from multiple perspectives, recognizing that housing really does affect everyone, uh, particularly here in Corte Madera. Um, so with that, maybe Adam, I'll let you, I'm gonna just make a quick plug for um, the where to find more information and the website and how to stay involved and then hand it over to Adam real quick to talk about next steps um, to address Glenn's question. So. If you, as I mentioned earlier, if there are any other questions or thoughts, the best place really to go is directly to the project website. As you've seen plugged on every single slide in this presentation, what Adam mentioned earlier, it's at cordomaderahousing.org. Please go there. The uh, recordings from presentations, summaries from presentations, a lot of technical information will be there as well. Um, Actually, you can you, also, can you, oh, is, sure. it, is it possible to pull, pull that up? Oh, right. Think, oh, the website. Or, you're, you're putting yeah. me on the spot, Adam. I know. Sure. It, let's see if we, that link works there. I don't know. We, we could do that. We could do that. Let's let's check it out, shall we? Just so you all could see <laughs> the actual website itself. I'm going to have to pull, pull it over. It from the, 
I think it speaks to the next steps as well. And so I want it, it, it's a convenient way to sort of answer, was it Glenn's question about next steps and the process going forward? Excellent um, point. Can you all see that okay? Did it come over? I have to probably stop sharing. You can see that? Okay, great, yep. great. So um, you, yep. Yeah, no, go ahead. I'll just, just give you a quick lay of the land. If you haven't visited the site, then I'm gonna hand it over to Adam to talk about next steps. But the site is very simply organized um, to give you a quick overview of the housing element process or the housing process in Corte Madera. Um, there's great information about up upcoming events that we'll talk to here. There's also opportunities to provide feedback for those that weren't able to join us at this meeting here tonight. Links to past events and all the great information that's shared there. Uh, and then on each subsequent page, there's just a little bit more, a deeper dive into the housing element itself, the overall timeline, and then an FAQ, which will continue to evolve and grow as we move through this process. And as we, we gather all the great questions from you all um, to make sure that, again, it's kind of comprehensive in our approach and, and we're hearing from multiple perspectives. And then lastly, there's a, a resources page with a lot of great information that will continue to evolve as well as we move through the process. So I'll stop talking and I'll hand it over to you, Adam. And Steve, I see your hand raised. Do you have a quick question? You go ahead and unmute yourself, Steve. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, I was just wondering about the, the zoning and the location where you, you want to put these. Are they going to all be in one big unit or are they going to be individual homes throughout the the town? And, and if they're going to change zoning yep. to put... Uh, put them in a group them all together where they're where it's not zoned for that now where you have big parcels now and you're going to stick a big multi-unit building in there amongst all the homes with on larger parcels i don't think that would be a very good idea well yeah, that's appreciate, an also, appreciate the question yeah, go ahead. yeah thanks steve i think that's a great segue to the next workshop which you can see on on the the screen here community workshop three we're going to start talking about potential housing development sites in Puerto Madera and get feedback I mean we'll, we'll we'll carry your comment right today into that meeting because I think that's exactly the type of comments we want to hear we're going to show some of um, obviously uh, some of the existing uh, context and maps and and some of the sites that we are um, thinking about as staff at that meeting uh, but certainly, I think you're right in, in pointing that out. We are going to have to think about, in order to uh, achieve a compliant housing element, um, we are going to have to look at uh, increasing or rezoning certain parcels and properties to allow more units than are currently allowed. But, you know, I want to, I think the, the idea is that we have this workshop series so that we can bring and have this discussion in a very transparent, open way about what it's going to take to get us there and where are the best and most appropriate sites to get that done. So um, please, uh, uh, yeah, Steve, you want to you go back to Steve? There sure, goes. Steve, you should be able to unmute yourself. Did you have a follow-up question? Yeah, okay. Yeah, the, the thing that comes to mind is on where uh, uh, Meadow Suite runs into Casa Buena down at the end there. There's a large parcel that's for sale. It's a huge, yep. big, triangular-shaped people in the corner. and. I, you know, I, I dread the thought of a big apartment type complex going in there. It had ruined the whole area, I think, you know, and that's, that's what I was having had in mind, something like that. Okay. That's good to know. That's definitely on our radar as well. I, I understand that. So, so I hope you can attend next, next month, getting back to Glenn's uh, question. We're workshop two of a six part workshop, housing element workshop series, which is really the, beginning of this 15-month uh, work plan that we have to uh, draft a new housing element, um, which, again, um, we talked about at our last October meeting. So, again, the second Wednesday of every month, 6.30 p.m., same Zoom link, come join us. Uh, the next meeting will be this potential housing development sites in Corte Madera. Then in January, we're really going to have to start to dig down and talk about Look, here are some, but here's some scenarios that we're going to have to consider in order to, to sort of um, get to uh, the 700 plus no number of units that could be facilitated uh, through uh, rezoning actions or other actions um, and so forth. So uh, we're getting into the the sort of the, that part. I know is pretty meaty and and it's going to be pretty um, 
uh, I think, dense. Uh, but uh, the next three workshops will really start to be devoted to that. Um, but I, I don't want to lose sight of really, I think, what we accomplished tonight, which was a really great discussion. I want, want to thank all of our panelists for, for agreeing to be here and sharing their thoughts uh, tonight with us. Um, and I uh, hope to talk to you more about uh, in the future about some of the things we discussed tonight. Thanks to all of our participants uh, this evening um, in the members of our community. Great, great questions, uh, good feedback. We'll take that all with us. Dave's going to be doing some summary work um, for us and, and posting this on our website. Um, so Dave, unless there's anything else or any other comments anybody else has, um, yeah, I just really want to thank everybody for joining us tonight and spending spending your, your valuable time and, and your thoughts with us. And please stay with us for the next few workshops as we go through this together. Excellent. No, I think that's a wrap. We actually ended up ending a few minutes early, which is fantastic. So we can let you all go enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Have a great night. We hope to see you again next month. Take care all. Bye.